everybody. It's Susie McMahon with my virtual book club. And tonight I am honored to have a special guest from Atlanta, Georgia, our featured author, Robert Gwaltney. And of course, you guys, our group expert, Francine Katzen. And welcome everybody to the virtual book club live meeting for the month of January in the new year of 2023. Hi, Robert. Hi, Francine. How are you? Good. How are you? Happy New Year. Thank you. And Francine, you doing good too? I'm doing great. Thanks. Happy to be here. Excited to talk to Robert. Happy New Year to you all. Thank you so much. So it takes a couple of minutes. We're right at the top of the hour. I see that there are a few um, book club members hopping on the live stream. Everybody, I just want to do a quick reminder that since we I use the um, format StreamYard, if you want me to know who you are when you make a comment, you need to give StreamYard the permission to use your name. If you don't feel like doing that, just put your name in the comments like it's Shoshana <laughs> and my question is, and that way I'll know. Sometimes you'll see me looking down at my phone because Facebook those that are friends of mine, I obviously can um, recognize who you are by those comments as well. But with no further ado, I'm going to start off with reading um, Robert's bio from the book cover, inside his book cover of, I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did, the Cicada Tree and Cicada. How, what's the right way to pronounce it, Robert? So we, we say Cicada, but I, I hear people pronounce it Cicada. Uh, we actually called cicadas locusts in South Georgia, which is not correct. So cicada, I think, is the, the, is the right the way. Yeah. It's like tomato, tomato, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome so much. So you guys, I want to read about the author. Raised along three fer feral, feral, I got to get my words out right tonight, younger brothers in the rash-inducing subtropical climate of Cairo, Georgia, Robert Gwaltney is a lifelong resident of the South, a circumstance that has left an indelible mark upon his voice as a writer. A graduate of Florida State University, okay, I, I can accept an ACC friend there. You guys see my Georgia, oops, wherever it is, right there. Um, <laughs> Gwaltney resides in Atlanta, Georgia. By day, he serves as the Vice President of Easter Seals, North Georgia, thank you for that, a nonprofit organization that strengthens children and their families during the most critical times in their development. Through his nonprofit work, he is a champion for early childhood literacy, Robert also serves as fiction editor for the Blue Mountain Review. In all of the hours between, he writes, and that's gotta be true. I noticed that with all your Facebook posts, you're behind your desk. The Cicada Tree is his debut novel, and please make sure to visit him at Robert L. G. Waltney, W A L T N E Y dot com. So welcome, welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It's great to, to actually meet you and uh, Francine. Virtually, I know we have a lot of interaction on social media, but it's great to actually be before you this evening. Thank you. Welcome. So Francine, I'm going to let you start off while I get myself organized and see who's rolling in. What is your first question for Robert tonight? Robert, could you just give us a little bit of, about your story? Actually, where did this story come from? And um, a little bit about the book. Uh, for us, please. We would love to hear the backstory of how this all got started and sure. how it came to be. So the Cicada Tree actually started as another book that, that I had begun to write, and it was going to take place in the 1970s, and the protagonist was going to be a little boy. And his mother is um, Annalise uh, Newell Darlington um, in the original book. And so several chapters in, I was so fascinated with the mother. I mean, she was making these really interesting and awful parenting choices. And I started to have conversations with her about what she must have been like when she was a girl. And really, um, it was sort of those questions and that sort of initial interaction that that led me to write the Cicada Tree. So I actually began to tell the story from uh, the 11 year old boy's mother, Annalise. Uh, and I just took her back to 1956 to the summer that she had turned 11. Okay. That, um, I love the 1950s. I love stories set in the 1950s. I always say that I wish I would have been an adult in the 50s. I don't, I don't know. know. 
I agree. I think, well, I think that's a very interesting time. Well, so first, just a quick little elevator blurb about the cicada tree. So it takes place in 1956. Um, it's the summer that 11-year-old Annalise Newell, who was a whiskey drinking piano prodigy, meets the wealthy Mayfield family for the very first time, a family that possesses a supernatural beauty that others refer to as that Mayfield shine. And the inciting incident of this novel is when Annalise meets the Mayfield family, uh, specifically uh, the matriarch and her daughter, Marlissa. And it's this initial meeting this, that really stirs um, obsession with Annalise, setting her down this path of manipulation and dangerous games, all of it culminating ultimately into this cataclysmic plague of, of cicadas. So I would say that um, it is, I think it's Southern fiction that has elements of magical realism. I, I think it perhaps crosses genre a bit in some places. But I love 1956 because this book is, is sort of Southern Gothic in nature. I sort of tip my, toe, tip my toes into that arena. But what I find fascinating about the 1950s is that many sort of regard it as sort of that last snapshot in time of innocence in the United States, in our country. And what was very fascinating about the 1950s, too, is that things weren't always what they seemed. You, know, you, you sort of scratch beneath the veneer and there's social, um, sexual um, oppression that's occurring. And so I felt like that time was perfect because it really sort of aligned with some of those things that I wanted to tap into within the cicada tree. I think you did that beautifully too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. And a follow-up, I just wanted to let everybody know that we've got our our large Texas contingent. Shoshana says hello. Um, Karen's here. Estelle Ford Williamson is watching us from Buford. Oh. And Denise Armstrong, Jill Fleming. So a lot of hellos from a little bit of Colorado, Texas, and a little bit of down south. Um, my follow-up question for you, Robert, is tell us when your creativity all started. Life. Was it um, childhood? Was it um, post Florida State? Was it while you were at Florida State? What gave you the sense that, hey, I want to write? So I, I think I first realized that it was possible to be a writer when I was in the third grade uh, in Miss Glenda Morton's third grade class. She actually invited one of my um, fellow students' mother to come in to speak to the class. And I didn't know it. I did not know until that day that she actually was an author and she had written um, a novel, which you probably refer to as cozy fiction today, but it was called Stone Gables. And I was so fascinated with the fact that someone from South Georgia could be a writer. You know, up until that point, I really thought that authors were um, these mythological creatures that lived in far off places, you know, like unicorns. I, they, I had a sense that they were out there, but I probably would never meet one up close and in person. Um, so I think that it was the third grade, really, I, I felt like that door um, opened as an opportunity for me. And um, I never forgot that day. So um, I always enjoyed reading. I enjoyed writing in school. I loved, um, I would write, I loved writing essays in high school. I took creative writing classes in college. But it wasn't until I moved to Atlanta in 2000 to take the job at the Easter Seals that I thought to myself, you know, I can sort of hear that, hear the clock ticking. If I don't begin taking this seriously, it's just never going to happen. So I, I joined the Atlanta Writers Club. I joined a critique group and I just began writing, playing in that creative sandbox. So it's something that I've always wanted to do. And fortunately, you know, it's something that I, I, I made myself pursue. I, I made myself be, be present in those endeavors. And uh, so it's, here I am in Cicada Tree is my, my debut novel. And congratulations on its success. Didn't I just see a post the other day that you're on the bestseller with some big names like Karen White and other authors like that at a local bookstore? Was yeah, that, that was so story? amazing. So there, there's an, an awesome independent bookstore. Uh, and I've, had, I've been fortunate to be able to visit quite a few um, during the book tour for the Cicada Tree. But Foxtel Bookshop um, has been a wonderful advocate. They actually managed the book sales for my book launch here in Atlanta back in February. Yeah, and I, it, it's astonishing. You're right. There's um, on that particular list of bestsellers at that bookstore, there's Karen White, 
um, is on that list. Um, Kimberly Brock, who is a friend of mine, who wrote The Lost Book of Eleanor Dare. Christopher Swan, who writes Southern Thrillers, was on there. So some some big names. It was um, it was it's, it's wonderful to make lists. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, <laughs> the A list. Hey, hey, Francine, what other question do you have for Robert? And I just want to let everybody know, not making a big deal, but Francine's got another book club that she has to attend to a little bit later. So when you see her disappear, she didn't have technical gremlins. She's just excusing herself. She's but I just, want you to be able to ask um, our wonderful guest Robert another question. Francine, go ahead. Did you find it difficult to continue with writing Annalise's character as an 11 year old? I mean, I'm still amazed that, I, I mean, it's just so beautifully written and, and believable. Like, was that hard? Did you take out a lot? And did you, and, and then a follow up question to that, did you write it from start to finish or do you do an outline? How, how do you write? Gosh, I, I'm a bit of a, a fly by the seat of my pants sort of writer, but I, I went into it having a sense of the big things that would happen in the story. And I do, my, my mind tends to work um, sequentially. So, you know, I did write from beginning to end. I didn't sort of start in the middle and or in the or in the end and work my way backwards. I really did write it sequentially. Um, and so the, so the other part of your question, well, oh, writing from the perspective of, an 11 year old girl, you know, I did not find it difficult at all. And, um, and I joke and say that I think perhaps maybe I've got an 11 year old girl living inside me. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, I think that my, my ear for, and my connection to, to, um, to girls and to women really has a lot to do with my upbringing. Um, I have a lot of strong, amazing Southern women in my family that, that brought me up and raised me up, my mom, my aunts, my grandmothers. So I always had an opportunity to sort of sit amongst them and, and listen to their conversations, which were always much more fascinating um, than what the men were saying in the other room while they were watching football. <laughs> um, and then, of course, I had a lot of close relationships. A lot of a lot of my friends growing up were, were girls, and a lot of my, uh, some of my strongest connections and relationships and friendships are are with women. So I've always felt a kinship emotionally. Mm -hmm. And I think that perhaps that's why um, I was able to, if, if, it, if I did indeed uh, write that character effectively, um, I think that's why I was able to do it. Well, you wrote her very effectively. And I, I kind of can see with having strong women in your life and influence. I mean, I'm a big believer in girlfriends and girlfriends. I mean, spouses is great and fine but girlfriend network you can't beat it like i just that's wonderful great. yeah Absolutely. so true so true so i have to say one of the things that i loved about reading your book is the imagery and that i had in my mind um, after growing up in Atlanta as well and being very familiar with the south and the low country um i compared it to another author you may or may not have met, um, Susan Zarenda. Um, Susan wow. Zarenda wrote The Bells of Eli. And what I what I mean by that comparison is um, on page 157 and chapter 20, um, your description of the Woolworth. And if you don't mind, you're going to read, but I just want to read this a little bit because I can... I went. I grew up in Sham, or near Shambly, Georgia, and attended Shambly High School. And in that little shopping center, there used to be a Woolworth, Woolworth store. And this imagery is so similar. Um, here he says, "This is there in the um, Saturday clamor of Woolworth. I sat with Abel Darlington. The swarm of butterflies still dusting in my insides. I mean, what teenager or adolescent, you know, can everybody can relate to the feeling of butterflies." But um, Abel bent his head to the straw, his glass resting on the table. I'm glad you like cherry Coke. It's my favorite, he said. He took a few hands-free sips and grinned. I know I'm not supposed to do that, but for some reason it just tastes better. I mean, I can just visualize sitting up at the counter with the red vinyl um, bar stools. And um, can you? did you take a lot of experiences from your own um, upbringing and incorporate it here in the story? I would think so. I did cherry pick things. You know, we, we didn't have a uh, we didn't have a Woolworth in Cairo, Georgia, but we had a Woolworth in Thomasville, Georgia, which was a town over. And so I remember going to Woolworth as a boy and 
sitting in those red booths with my mom when we'd be out for a day of shopping. So yeah, so some of those things I so the um, Providence, Georgia, um, where the novel takes place, is, is a is a fictional town, but I did cherry pick things from from Cairo, Georgia, where I grew up, and the yeah. surrounding area. Now I remember going to Cairo when I was in either elementary or school or high school. Is there a monastery there, or am I dreaming that? Um, I, I'm I, yeah, I, I don't. You know what? I, I do not believe that there's a monastery in Cairo, okay. Georgia, but yeah. I could be mistaken. All right, there's something come, I don't know. Something in my memory bank just came up to the surface. But I, I'm going to let Francine ask one more question before she's got to go. What else would you like to ask Robert tonight, Francine? Oh, this might be a silly question, but this is your debut novel. What was the best thing that came out of this that you weren't expecting? Like, how is this better than you thought it would be with the, all the coverage that this book has gotten and, and all of us saying how great it is. How, how has that been for you? It's uh, well, I, I've approached this, this, this whole journey with a great deal of gratitude and um, I am, it's exceeded what I thought that, that the book would be able to do. You know, I'm coming up with, you know, a small publisher. Um, I've done, yeah, yeah. I'm a debut novelist, and there's so many beautiful books out in the world. You know, we have a new batch that come out every Tuesday. So there's a lot of noise out there, a lot of competition. And it's just been a really wonderful year. And I think that the most satisfying part of this is, ha is having the opportunity to sit down with individuals um, like you, Francine and Susie, to talk about the book. And what I've also loved is being able to go to bookstores and to be able to sit down and have conversations with readers who who enjoyed the book. So it, it, it at times is, I mean, it, this is an overused term, but it, it is sort of surreal. It's dreamlike um, to think that you've written something that might resonate with someone else. So more than anything else, I'm grateful. Pinch me moment. Yes, absolutely. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Yes, you go for it. I'm, I, I'm already, want, I want to know if you're working on something else and when's the next book coming out? So I am, at the, I'm like four chapters into a new project. I think it, it's much heavier in the um, arena of magical realism. Uh, the, the working title, I'm calling it right now, Sing Down the Moon. And it, it's Southern fiction. It takes place on a fictitious Georgia coastal barrier island in 1931, a place I'm calling Good Hope. And it's going to be told in first person, I hope, uh, from the perspective of a 14-year-old girl named Leontine Skye, who lives on the marsh with her mother. And um, she comes from a long line of women who have this responsibility of tending this ancient tree named Damascus. And it's from this tree that they actually make this highly sought after and very addictive drug called redemption. And it's um, individuals that are addicted to this drug and who seek it out, they call sinners. Um, and so I think at the heart of the story, what, what this young woman wants more than anything is to escape her destiny of tending that Hank trap, what, what she calls a Hank trap tree. Um, and she dreams of a life beyond good hope. All right. Now I have to follow up with all of those wonderful low country words you just used and kind of <laughs> um, ask you, I mean, it sounds a lot like Buford or, or somewhere um, down along the coast, Charleston or somewhere, especially with the trees. I mean, the trees are so majestic in that part of our, um, uh, the Gullah Geechee corridor, basically. Is that some of the inspiration? So when I, you know, I, I've had this assemblance of this idea for, a few years while I was writing the cicada tree. And I'm, I'm one of those writers who I try not to get distracted. I, I know so many, so many writers who are so prolific and they always have a new idea. But for me, I just sort of become a, obsessed uh, with the existing story. But while I was right, when I took a break from the cicada tree, I started to think about things that I might work on next. And um, I'm fascinated with Cumberland Island. So I, I believe that I, I be, first began to think of Cumberland. And then, of course, I've had an opportunity. I've never visited Cumberland, but I have had an opportunity to visit uh, the, uh, the the Georgia Coastal Isles, St. Simons Island, Jekyll Island. I've had an opportunity to visit Beaufort. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so some inspiration uh, for this book has come from my firsthand experiences visiting those places. 
Fantastic. I've always got, you know, I'm in the travel industry. So, and I love you for, so I'm always trying to make a connection or correlation, even if one doesn't exist. But I have a, um, a comment and a question from a, fe a former featured author and friend of ours, Estelle Ford Williamson. I'm going to go ahead and read that here. Um, she said she remembers there was a reporter in Atlanta, in, George in Atlanta, Georgia, because her beat, let me see, I remember as a reporter in Atlanta um, during her beat, hearing the Jackie Kennedy, now a widow, was a fox hunt in South Georgia near Thomasville. She understood there was a lot of northern money that flowed into that particular place due to the warm weather relative to up north. Lots of room for horse farms, etc. Did you did that set up dynamics of wealth versus non-wealth in the community you came from? And did that affect your writing in your novel? It's a long question. So I think that you know there's this element of obsession within the book, you know, with Annalise and the Mayfield family. And I think it's hard to get away from that when you live in a small town. You know, when for me, you know, it seemed it seemed to me that my life was quite ordinary. So I was always drawn to individuals who I felt lived a glamorous existence. And sometimes those more glamorous individuals were those individuals who happened to be wealthy in, in the community that I grew up in and surrounding areas like Thomasville, Georgia. So uh, I think that that's one of the things that I shared with the character Annalise was, um, was her fascination with people who have lives different than her own. So absolutely, those were... Um, uh, and of course, one of the things that you come to find out um, as you become older and wiser is that, you know, your life wasn't quite as ordinary as that you thought that it was and that, you know, all along that there was beauty surrounding you. Um, and then, of course, um, people aren't um, and things aren't always who and what they seem. Absolutely. There's always backstories and such. A, I, I, that's such an elegant way of looking at the aging process, too. <laughs> <laughs> that we're able to, to know more. Um, another question that just came up from Facebook user, I'm not quite sure who asked this, but you mentioned that the that you first started a book about Annalise's child um, with an adult Annalise. Will there be a book about that ever written about her, Annalise's child? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to say never. I've learned to not say never because I've had to go back and eat some words and things. I've said like, oh, I'll never write this or I'll never do that. And then I wind up doing it. Um, I, it would be interesting to go back and pursue the story further. Um, I sort of like the idea. Um, I think if I were going to pick up the story again, I think it would be a couple of years later. And, um, you know, I sort of have a sense of my list of coming back to reclaim mistletoe. That would be interesting. So at this point in time, I was wondering if you selected an excerpt from your novel that you would like to read to us, and, um, Robert. Absolutely. So I'll um, I'll read from the first chapter, um, and I'll just read the um, the second scene. The sky boomed, rattling the walls of our clapboard house, jostling the windows in their shoddy frames. Ed and me and I passed the aisle at Daddy's old upright, attempting to rehearse the stranger's funeral song. Ed and May's gift was singing, and mine the piano, each of us the perfect accompaniment to the other. Though I never played it before, stormy weather was the only song my heart could remember, as though it were the only song that ever was. I always knew how to play, where my fingers should go, an instinct planted way down deep, just as easy as breathing. Daddy thought it had been he who taught me, but I knew long before, back before I first opened my eyes to the world. It was easy pretending, just a little lie, a reason to be close if just for a spell. But that was when he loved his mama and me, before he drank all the good away. Sure is pretty, Miss Wessie hollered from the kitchen. The two of you could coax an angel right down from heaven. Don't it make you sad, I said, singing for dead folks. She sucked in her bottom lip and let it loose. No, not really. She cast her green flecked eyes down at her hands, running them the length of her fingers. But I knew the truth of it. Somewhere in that deep down spot where the music lived and swirled, I knew when she sang, she sang for her poor sweet mama. Percussion rolled above us, vibrating the floorboards. Piano keys shivered. Everywhere was music, even in the clink of mama's jelly jar face. 
Wish I could go with you, I said. My voice sounded peculiar amidst the storm's refrain. Me too. Etta May sat down next to me on the piano bench, leaning her head against my shoulder. But you get to go to the Mayfields. She feathered her fingers across my arm. Folks say the whole town could fit right inside their house. I guess. I contemplated the size of such a place, the place Mama went on Saturdays to earn extra money. It must take a long time to clean. Maybe you could play with Marlissa. Marlissa, such a pretty name. I poked gently at the cicada shell hidden inside my pocket. In truth, I knew very little of the Mayfields or their daughter Marlissa. Mama never spoke of them, and I had yet to see one up close and in the flesh. Only the passing of their long black car through town. The world caught and reflected in the sheen of its darkened windows. One more time, Miss Wessie said from the kitchen. Then it's dressing time. The rain dissipated. The weight of Miss Wessie's feet across the floorboards audible once more. Etta May lifted her head from my shoulder. The cicada shell shifted in my pocket, the sharp tips of its legs sticking into my skin, grabbing hold around my finger. I flicked at the thing until it turned loose, my fingers finding their place on the keys. Etta May did not wait for my music, finding the song within her without the help of a single note of mine. I pulled my hands from the piano and listened, sorrow seeping from the perfect pitch of her soprano. I sat, eyes shut, letting her enchantment settle over me, feeling a tingle just under my skin. The weight of the thing growing until it sat heavy, pressing against my insides, until there was nothing left for me to do but cry. Rain fell against the tin, at first a smattering, the tempo gaining speed, the force greater until there was no other sound, nothing left of the music but a deafening whir and the vinegary taste of sadness on my tongue. Beautiful. Thank you. I, I can feel the thunder and I can feel the little cicada shell that I've touched at some point in my life. I don't know I did it a lot, but I know anybody that has, it's a unique little feeling, isn't it? Thank yes. you. It's very prickly. Yes. Robert, thank you for that. I think I've found over the last couple of years that one of my favorite parts of the virtual of this virtual book club is when an author will treat us to reading their own words. Um, we've talked about how it's as close as we can get to the real, you know, what came out of your brain and onto the paper. And when we hear it in your own voice, it's it's magical. And thank you for that treat. Thank you. Um, I um, have a question from Shoshana in Texas, and this is a perfect segue question from what you just read. With Annalise being a prodigy in piano and Etta Mae having operatic voice, did what is your background in music? Do you have some previous knowledge so you were able to bring that into the novel? So I, I consider myself a failed musician, <laughs> but I've always been fascinated by, um, by individuals who have extraordinary abilities. And I'm, I'm a lover of music. I actually, um, I was in the, the, the music program in school from middle school through high school. I played in the marching band and the concert band and was drum major in, in high school. But I've always been a lover of music. Um, I took one year piano and I was awful at it. Um, but I admire individuals who, who, who can do it beautifully. That's fantastic. Thank you for that answer. And if anybody has any other um, questions you would like me to facilitate with our wonderful guest here, Robert, feel free to put them in the comments. I can't always work them all in, but I try my best by looking at what's going on on both of my screens. Um, so one of the questions that we do always ask um, earlier, um, um, Francine took my thunder and because she wanted to know um, but what you're working on next. And thanks for sharing with that. Can you tell me just a little bit about your personal um, life, a day in the life as a, an author? Um, you know, you have your full time job and then you say you work um, on writing pretty much all the other times. Can you tell us when you feel like you're most creative? Um, is, is there something that you set up? Um, to bring bring out that creativity, which what is your secret? So I, I'm I'm an early morning writer. I tend to be more productive, more creative in the early hours. I'm I'm working hard right now to get my my body um, 
uh, reprogrammed into being able to get back up early before I start the regular work day. Right. So um, when I'm riding regularly, I'll get up uh, during the work week about 4.30 in the morning and um, ride for a couple of hours until 6.30 and then until I have to get ready and, and leave for the office. And then, of course, weekends are really important. Uh, and, they're, and my favorite riding time on the weekends because I don't have um, the other the, the, that other part of life sort of hanging over my head and distracting me. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. And um, one of the other questions I always like to ask is, what um, are you? What inspires you the most? What are you, what what's on your bedside table or um, on your to be read list um, right now? What kind of recommendations do you have for us? So I am reading. So um, it, it's an, it's a southern novel and it's titled. Red Clay Susie by Jeffrey Dale Lofton. He's a debut novelist, and uh, I've gotten to know him through social media. I'm actually going to be, he um, lives in Washington, D.C. His book comes out next week on January 10th, so he um, allowed me an opportunity to have a an advanced peek, and I'm going to be interviewing him. We're going to um, be having a conversation at Fox Hill Bookshop um, at the end of the month, so I'll have an opportunity to meet Jeffrey in person. But it's a wonderful coming of age book that takes place in the South with LGBTQ things. And for anyone that's not from Georgia, red clay is a real thing, especially around the lakes and the riverbeds around the Chattahoochee. It's one of the thick, thickest substances. We could have probably just built buildings um, stronger uh -huh. than what we already have. It's like just as strong as tabby. Um, and then I always want to bring in you mentioned you visited Buford, and and I've been um, one of my goals is to support the Pat Conroy Literary Center with the uh, Low Country Literary and Leisure Getaways that I've done last year and planning on doing this March. Um, tell me what your connection has been um, with the um, Pat Conroy Center and what you like most about um, what they're doing there. Sure. Well, so first, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Pat Conroy's writing. And you know, it's a wonderful nonprofit that 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 supports the legacy of Pat Conroy, but um, but it also supports the writing community and and young people as well who were interested in pursuing careers in in, in writing. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit the Pat Conroy Literary Center. I think it was last March, and I had an event that was sponsored through them uh, through Nevermore Books. So I had an opportunity to tour. Uh, the Pat Conroy Literary Center, and Jonathan Howell is the executive director. And there's something very magical about Beaufort. You know, there's something in the air. It, it's a wonderful artist's community. And you, know, you, you just, there's just this wonderful sense of history there. And there's something quite, quite magical about the place. I had an opportunity. I was um, selected to serve as uh, the writer in residency for the Pat Conroy Literary Center. Um, a couple of months back, back in October, uh, during the Pat Conroy Literary Festival. Mm -hmm. And I was hosted by a wonderful woman named Mary Ellen Thompson, who allowed me to stay in her, her lovely uh, Marsh Song Cottage. So I had an opportunity to stay on there on the marsh and do some research for the book that I'm working on now. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. I love how there's so many connected connections in what you just described and, and what I'm trying to do with um, the literary getaways that we've done for the last two years. I mean, to me, being in travel and then having this book club come together back in 2020, starting with Rebecca Dwight Bruff, I was like, how do I merge them? And I just found um, my love for Buford and these getaways that I used to coordinate um, and plan back during a lockdown, it gave me a lot of time to try to be, I'm not the best writer in the world, but I created a travel experience where we're bringing the pages um, of last year was The Water is Wide by Pat Conroy and this year it's The Prince of Tides. Um, <coughs> and what we do is try to embrace the whole area and of course visit the Pat Conroy Literary Center and feature different authors from last year. Um, and then we're actually gonna go out to Fripp Island this year and go on the river so people can experience, you know, the waterways, which are quite magical. I um, I quote Jonathan Haupt with this, um, you know, there there is something magical about Beaufort with the creativity in it. And he believes it's because, you know, the world is created and, and uncreated and created again every day with the tides. Um, and I think that might be part of 
um, the magic there, but the people are wonderful. The scenery is wonderful and it's just a great place to visit. Um, Robert, I normally at this point um, have um, two different authors, you know, asking people, you know, each other a question, but I'm going to take it from the standpoint of if I were an author starting out, what would be your, um, what would be your advice for get, getting going? If you were scared to death, but you knew you wanted to, what is your experience? Would, well, what kind of experience would you provide? I think what's really important for anyone, you know, um, endeavoring to do anything really, especially writing, is to um, is to surround yourself with a supportive community of other writers, um, you know, and uh, meeting individuals and connecting with individuals who have your best interest at heart. I find that you know, 99.5 percent of my experiences um, with other writers have been so positive, and it's just a beautiful community, very wonderful and supportive community. So find your people and find individuals. I always say, um, it, I remember my first day of first grade, my, my granny Louise um, whispered into my ear, she said, find the smart people and sit next to them. And I think that that's, that's wonderful advice. And I've always, um, I, I came to learn, of course, you know, what that meant. And uh, really, it's just never be the smartest, most talented person in the room because that's a room that you, you will not grow and you will not learn and you will not be able to endeavor to become your best self. So surround yourself with amazing people. Mm -hmm. That's really good advice. I appreciate that. So when do you see you being able to, not that I want you to leave your nonprofit role because I, I know you're vital to the organization, but would your goal be to... Um, to at some point be a full-time writer or do you like having it as a side effect? Well, I think that, I think that right. most, most writers dream of being able to write full-time and there are so very few individuals just because of the world of publishing that, you know, are able to sustain themselves writing full-time. Um, but it would be wonderful to have an opportunity to be able to just focus on, on writing. I think that would certainly be, be a gift. For sure. So one of our other fa Facebook users today said great for your answer a second ago, great advice for so many aspects of life. And I agree with that so much. Um, I think that the world that we live in um, with social media, sometimes you can really quickly go down negative rabbit holes. And it's it's so important um, to surround yourself by people that have your back and and we don't always have to think the same thoughts, um, no. but definitely to stay in a, in a positive, um, constructive conversation. Exactly. One final question for you. Um, what attracted you to magical realism? Gosh, you know, I think, and I, I've thought about that lately, and I've really thought about that um, in this new project that I'm working on. I think that in life, I am a magical thinker. And I think that, um, you know, we all go through tough times and you know, we all go through challenging times. And I think that when I personally have had obstacles before me, um, I've always sort of told myself stories and I've engaged in magical thinking, you know, just um, uh, imagining the situation perhaps a little different than it actually is. Not really disconnecting from reality, but, you know, just um, um retreating into my imagination, you know, until at which point, you know, I, I feel better and I can continue to move forward. That's beautiful. I love that. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a good way. It's a good way of thinking. And I think um, there's something that I would just like to correlate it to. I had never read, this might be sacrilegious, but um, Anne, A-N with capital A-N-N, capital E, uh, at, um, the the Gables the Green Gables um, story. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I call it the Canadian version of Little House on the Prairie. But I found it recently on Netflix, and I was so enamored by the show and about her imagination and just the sweet everyday kind of things that happen in our lives. Um, but just uh, the love that was expressed in that story and. And how she, you know, psychologically had to use the magical, you know, the, her imagination to be able to make it through so much trauma. That's, that's an interesting concept. 
Well, I'm going to turn to you and just say, what would be your um, your final comments to my virtual book club? Um, any challenges you have for the new year? And then you can go off and enjoy your evening because it's so much later on the East Coast and I'll do a little book club business. But Robert, I want to thank you for spending 40 minutes with us on this thank wonderful my pleasure. Ministry. my pleasure. And again, I think that what I would just like to conclude with is, is my gratitude and thanks. Thank you so much. And for anyone who took the time to, well, first of all, spend your money to buy the book and then to spend the time to read it. Thank you. And um, I hope you enjoyed it. And I just certainly do appreciate all the support. It, it's made for a wonderful year. Wonderful. And Robert, I hope to meet you at some point in our, my travels back through Atlanta um, oh and maybe even in Beaufort. And I wish you the best of luck um, with your next um, next works. And um, I just have to say go dogs to everybody watching. But anyway, okay. Robert, have um, I've got another comment real quick just to close out because I like to include everybody. Um, Dana, um, ride an hour, you know. Oh, I know Dana. Hey, Dana. Yeah. We just had a great conversation and um, she said, great conversation, Robert, love the book. Um, thanks for joining us, my friend, Dana. Robert, thank you for your time and keep your creativity going. I hope that there's more success for you in the future. Thanks. Thank you so much. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. Wow, how what a wonderful conversation that was with Robert. I um, am so glad to see a good active group of us tonight. You guys um, have excited me for the year, new year of 2023. Thanks for joining for um, our virtual book club this January when we discussed, and if you haven't read it yet, um, please feel free to try to pick up a copy of uh, Robert Waltney's The Cicada Tree. Um, it is magical. It is, uh, I love the imagery like I talked about earlier, reminding me of my time and um, growing up in Atlanta. Never realized yeah, I'm growing up in the true South, but I really, really did um, with Woolworths and different things like that. Um, but with that, I just want to let everybody know, I don't have a copy of it in front of me, but our featured book this month is, is the Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy. We're going to read it in January. And then in February, Jonathan Haupt will meet with us um, on this kind of um, platform on Facebook Live through StreamYard. And we will discuss the Prince of Tides. And that is a segue um, to getting us ready for the second annual Low Country Literary and Leisure Getaway in Beaufort, South Carolina, where we try to make the pages come alive of that book, but also to give you an overview of the wonderful area um, to have you meet featured authors that we had last year. Um, if you want any more information, I'll be uploading all of that in our group and on my Facebook page tomorrow. Um, we were full. I had um, two cancellations, so I am able to add a couple more um, guests to that. So if you're interested, send me a message. Um, I think that's about all for tonight. If you want to find out um, what other books that we are, what other books we're reading, it's always listed in the cover photo of the virtual book club. Um, I don't know if you probably can't see this. No, it's got too much glare. At the very top, um, there is um, a photo and it has what we're reading each month. So just an FYI, in case you want to pick some of these books up, um, this month we're reading The Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy. Next month we're reading two books because some of you may have already read one. It's um, the memoir by Cassandra King, Tell Me a Story About Her Life with Pat Conroy. Again, trying to prepare you and have material that you read for that getaway for those of you that are attending. And then also we are going to be reading The Lioness by Mark Powell. Uh, Dana Ridenauer, Ridenauer introduced us to him last summer. I remember it was June because I was on island. And, and in March, just recently, last month, we met Stephanie Edwards, and we're going to read her novel, What We Set in Motion, in March. In April, I can't wait to read the second of several of Dana Radenauer's books, Behind the Cabin. And in May, mentioned earlier tonight by Robert, The Lost Book of Eleanor Dar by Kimberly Brock. Um, so that is our timeline for all the way through May. And at that point in time, um, we will see what direction we're going to take the book club. Um, if you love it, 
I want you to go in the comments and say, hashtag love the book club. Um, if you're not able to keep up, say hashtag I'm too busy, you know, just let me know what you want. And do you want us to continue um, to feature one book a month? Um, thank you, Estelle. She said, thanks for the great discussion. This book was a fascinating read. I'll never see fire. Anymore. That's a very good point. I'm wishing you all a happy new year. I hope you all, um, and no offense to any of my friends in the Dallas or Texas area, because there's so many of you on here, but I really hope that my University of Georgia Bulldogs have a back-to-back -back, um, <laughs> victory this coming up uh, next week, a week from now. I'll wave to you from LA as I root on the dogs and happy reading everybody. Good night.